So whenever I'm surfing the World Wide Web and I come across a forum or a Reddit thread about YouTube channels in the pro audio or music creation space, it is filled with a lot of polarized assumptions. A lot of people think that if a piece of audio gear shows up on screen in a YouTube production video, it is paid product placement. Other people think that everybody is making music in exchange for free gear. Some people believe that anytime they are hearing a YouTube creator speak, they are being marketed to. And guess what? If you look at the entire spectrum of audio YouTube, all of the above are probably true depending on what video you're watching and what creator is making it. While attempting to, I guess, look at the psychology of a YouTube channel from the outside, I realized that I didn't know if I was or wasn't an influencer. And if I am an influencer, should I be ashamed of it? Does that make me a significantly less popular and successful Jake Paul? Or should I be proud of it? Influencing people is pretty righteous and powerful. It would generally mean that you're not a dumbass, right? So like nobody should ever do, I asked Twitter. So in your opinion, generally speaking, am I an influencer? And 62% said yes, but very few of those who voted seem to agree on the definition of the term influencer. So I started asking this question to the marketing people that constantly appear in my email inbox asking me to influence you and none of them could provide a similar answer to the other. <laughs> and so what we have here is a $20 billion influencer marketing industry that hires influencer marketing managers who can't even agree on what an influencer even is. The problem here is, is that if you, the viewer, cannot with confidence define what an influencer is, then you're far less likely to be able to tell the difference between valuable information and marketing. And that's actually really scary when you consider that this wasn't an issue 20 years ago when everybody could more or less clearly tell the difference between the crocodile hunter and an ad for life insurance. But I've learned a lot during my time as an influencer, and in this video, I am just going to tell you how much I make from this channel and who is paying me. I'm going to tell you how much I could be making from this channel and who I won't accept money from and who I'm telling to get fucked. I'm going to burn a lot of bridges, but they're bridges to Pooh Island, and I am actually not that big of a fan of Pooh, so I don't really want to go to Pooh Island, so it's fine. If you hate influencers and internet personalities, this video is going to be porn. A few years ago, the Federal Trade Commission released the rules that creators or influencers must follow. And frankly, I can't think of one creator in my or any space of YouTube who has accurately followed them. And that's because they are completely insane. So here is the MotorSynth Make 2 that came in the mail last week. And I've yet to turn it on and I know very little about it other than that it looks unique and interesting in some basic specs. I don't know how much it's worth. I don't know what other content creators have featured it. And here's how it ended up here. This is Mattis from Game Changer Audio. I'm reaching out to see if you'd be interested in taking the MotorSynth Make 2 for a spin. The latest firmware is finally out and we'd love to send you a demo unit. I respond, hey Mattis, this looks cool. I can't promise a video feature or anything, but I'd be interested in checking it out. Here's my mailing address. I get a response back. Sounds good. The end. Now, of course, every single channel works differently and every single video has different circumstances. But in this circumstance, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna plug it in and play with it. And if I think that it's cool and unique enough and something that my viewers would wanna see, then I'll make a video about it. Now, if I like it and I wanna keep it for my own personal use, I will probably just not bring it up with the company and just assume that they want me to keep it and sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Most companies want me to keep things because they often get used with other gear in future content or on streams or just because they like hearing music I'm making with their gear. However, it needs to be said that in the entire time that I've had this YouTube channel, I've never sold a piece of gear that I've been sent for free. Now, if I get a piece of gear that I don't vibe with or find interesting or fun or like, then I will contact the company and ask them if they want to hear some constructive criticism. They usually do. And I will offer to send it back or send it to another musician. Now, if I get a piece of gear that I really like and I want to use it to make my own music with, but I don't think that you'll like it or I just don't think it would make a good YouTube video, then I'll offer to pay the company for it and hope they give me a discount. Believe it or not, the reason that I don't have more videos with bad reviews is not because I'm simping to brands. It's because the entire world around me seemingly has a meltdown when I make a critical video. It also seems like a waste to set all this up and use all this recording gear and like most of my week to make a video just telling you that something sucks. So I show you cool stuff on here 
and I bitch about stuff that sucks on Twitter. If I were to accurately follow the Federal Trade Commission and YouTube rules, I'd have to mark this entire video as paid promotion, and I would clearly have to disclose my relationship and agreement with the brand in the description, in both the audio and the video, and if the video is more than a few minutes long, often throughout the video. And then I would have to <laughs> disclose this anytime I said something positive about the product. I do kind of like the design on this box that I was sent for possibly free from Game Changer Audio in an ambiguous agreement via email exchange. And for the rest of time, if I so much as heart or like a Game Changer audio post on Instagram or comment cool vid on their YouTube channel or any public interaction, I have to publicly disclose that I was sent something for free in an ambiguous email exchange. And then you also have to disclose if you have a friend, family member, or acquaintance who works with or for any company that you work with when you're talking about that company. And imagine any other medium or type of content doing this. I hate making promises in general, but unless something radically changes, I can personally promise you that I will never recommend a product or service that I don't personally like. In general, unless it's for the purpose of comedy or obvious entertainment, I'm not going to lie to you. And this is for a very objective and advantageous reason, not because I'm some super morally righteous person. It's because I'm working on pro audio products that I think you will find really useful. I will one day in good faith be shilling my own products that will help and inspire you to create more things, and it will be very obvious. So it is in my best interest to earn and keep your trust. Plus common sense here, uploading a video blatantly lying to a couple hundred thousand people on the internet is probably a really dumb idea in general. But let me tell you about how much people offer me to lie to you. So this is all from the last month, and I'm assuming that any YouTube channel that has sub or view counts comparable to mine has an inbox that looks like this. So without further ado, from my perspective, Here's how much money honesty costs. So Brilliant, the educational app subscription thing, uh, semi-scripted 50-second ad read, they even included a word cloud to help, $4,500 for three videos. Blinkist, which I think is like an audiobook company, 60-second ad read, $2,000 per video. Seven different people contacted me about Blinkist, ranging from $600 to $3,000 if I have viewership minimums. NordVPN, CyberGhost VPN, Atlas VPN, Surfshark VPN, one of these had a 90-second ad read where I would have to do a demonstration. They'd offer $5,800 for that. The lowest offer was $1,500 for a 15 second sponsorship bump in the beginning of a video. Raid Shadow Legends ranging from $2,000 to $6,000 depending on if I'm willing to literally just start playing the fucking game and talking about how addicted I am to it in the middle of a video shoot. Atacama, Atacama, I don't even know what they do. $2,500 for a 30 second read. Skillshare, $2,000 for a 90 second ad read. Who is doing a minute and a half ad reads? Masterworks, which is some company where you buy shares of pieces of artwork, like their stocks or something, which is actually kind of an interesting concept, but it also seems like something that would just not exist one day and all of your money would be gone. $5,000 for an ad read with view minimums. A bunch of meal subscription services, of course. Gimme Swag wants to make toy figures of me and then have me try to get you to buy them. <laughs> The fuck? Elsie wants me to test out a shock collar on my dog. I don't know how much they're gonna pay, but I told them that if somebody came near my dog with one of those, I'd beat them to death with a tire iron. And they didn't respond. A few different companies wanna pay me to replace my studio desk with a crappy motorized standing desk. There's always a bunch of crappy e-bike companies and I'm just like, have you watched a second of my videos before emailing me? Now there are a few non-audio things that I actually am interested in. Power Vision wanted to send me an underwater drone and I was like, yes, I will absolutely use that in something, but then their email address bounced, which isn't uncommon with Chinese companies. And then there's another company that wants to send me this state-of-the-art robotic lawnmower, and I told them that I absolutely will take it if I can try to program it to mow every single lawn in my subdivision to see how far it gets. No word back on that, but we'll see. It's important to note that a lot of these companies have sent me dozens of emails for the same campaign, oftentimes dozens of third-party representatives with dozens of emails per representative. So for example, in the last month, this was the case with Blinkist. So that tells me that Blinkist must have an amazing affiliate program. And for the purpose of research, I was able to get an affiliate offer directly where I'd get in between $25 and $40 per sign up, plus a small new customer bonus on top of that. Now, if I actually signed up for that affiliate program and convincingly told you how awesome Blinkist was and how much I liked 
liked it, I would probably make a whole lot more money from your signups than I would from the upfront money that they had offered me. It seems like the people who were desperately trying to get me to sign an affiliate deal with Blinkist were living in a developing country working for commission or extremely low wages with contract bonuses. At least in all of the cases I learned about, they would be hired by someone in Israel or America who simply finds high affiliate payout programs, runs some numbers, and then tells underpaid sales staff in developing countries to aggressively try to negotiate as little payment as possible from YouTubers. Now, I honestly have no idea if companies like Blinkist or these VPN companies even know about this, but they should know that influencers and content creators are actively being harassed by people pretending to be ambassadors to their brand. It's also worth noting that most, if not all, of these ad reads would not be approved by the marketing agency if they appropriately followed the FTC rules I mentioned earlier in this video. Stay tuned, it gets way fucking slimier. By the way, I'm always curious who is buying ad space on my channel through YouTube, so let me know in the comments what ad you see now. So with influencer marketing being far more invisible for you, the consumer, by design, it also skirts terms of service rules and federal advertising regulations. My favorite example of this is the ultra edgy Instagram account, Fuck Advertisements, which has run sneaky ads for everything from movie trailers to Michael Bloomberg's presidential campaign. And once you know this, it's not exactly hard to figure out that there tends to be a whole lot of visible logos of brands in posts, but where it gets even more suspicious is how many of these logos and memes feature tobacco brands. And it's not like tobacco brands haven't already been caught skirting these laws on social media. But this, for example, it's Joe Camel. It's hilarious, isn't it? Really ironic and funny. As far as I can tell through reverse image searching, it's also not even vintage. It appears that this artwork was made just for this post. I can't say for sure, but how likely is it that this is a paid advertisement? And if it is, it's directly advertising fucking cigarettes to children. But how do you even prove that? And without a federal legal warrant to get information from Instagram or Facebook, which is pretty difficult to get, how could you even pin the account on a single organization? I've personally had some colleagues reach out to fuck advertisements to inquire about marketing and didn't get very far in figuring out who they actually were. These Instagram accounts that seemed like random users posting memes that relate to us are owned and operated by marketing agencies. And it's really deviant. The goal here isn't so much for users to see paid content on Fuck Jerry or Emotional Club, but for users to see their friends reposting or sharing it on their Instagram stories, for example. This removes any suspicion that you might be looking at an advertisement and it builds the message from somebody you know and trust. Make no mistake, the content that you are absorbing or sharing is crafted from the same marketing executives who worked for television ad agencies a decade ago. For example, the director of ad sales at Fuck Jerry and all the accounts managed by Jerry Media made a lateral move to that position from ad sales at Warner Media and Turner Broadcast before that, generating millions in business with everything from drug company to investment group marketing. In 2021, I mixed some duck food with water, put it in front of my ducks, and made a TikTok. I have invented duck crack. That video got 3.7 million views. I know. It's worth pointing out that I made nothing from it because I didn't have enough followers before the video was uploaded to qualify to be paid from TikTok, a conveniently moving goalpost. But then I got an interesting message on Instagram from Bitch. Bitch is a super popular Instagram meme account with nearly 6 million followers. It was, at the time, at face value, an ambiguous young woman who reposts funny stuff. Well, Bitch and the Facebook version Betch is operated by Collab Incorporated, a company that pays the salary of about 100 people through the business of empowering artists, aka milking their intellectual property. Bitch asked me if I wanted to make some money from my video and immediately name dropped MTV, Ellen, Jimmy Kimmel, Comedy Central, Netflix, and so on. Like, oh yeah, I was hoping that we could pitch this duck slurping pilot to Netflix and I needed to connect. Thanks, bitch. So it starts sounding like any music volume licensing scam. They go on to mention random dollar amounts and act now as time is of the essence. So I take the bait so I could look at the contract, which not only gives Collab Incorporated 50% of my income, but my image and likeness in perpetuity. That means forever with no escape or mediation clause. This appears like a publishing agreement or an intellectual property management agreement 
for a piece of video content, but you're literally just giving a massive network of influencers free content to post and monetize across all platforms. Naturally, I didn't sign it, but Bitch followed up telling me that their DRM team found out that other people were using my content on YouTube without my permission and were making money from it, and that Collab can collect that money on my behalf. They sent me some links to infringers, and one of them already had millions of views on a compilation video using my material. And I'm going to protect my source and call this person Video Snitch. I got in contact with Video Snitch, who posted the meme compilation, and simply asked if they were associated with Collab. Yep, it appears that Collab already licensed it to them without me signing the contract. I asked Bitch if Video Snitch is a collab partner, and she just casually said, nope. By the way, this is just one of many meme accounts that have reached out to me and tried to rope me into a multi-channel network that had siphoned revenue from a viral video. Here's another one from Feelsworthy with the same name-dropping sales pitch. Lad Bible is another company that has driven me insane over the years trying to scam me out of my own content earnings. What's even worse, in a lot of these contracts, they reserve the exclusive right to sue other people for using your content on your behalf and at your expense. Some of them lump in all of your future content in perpetuity. They are utter fucking scumbags. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I feel like it's a fairly transparent industry and my feelings toward affiliate links have been a bit of a roller coaster over the years anyway. For the last few years, I've had affiliate links with Perfect Circuit because I've been to the store a bunch of times, they've supported my weirder creative endeavors, and for almost a year now, I've donated all of my affiliate income to the ACLU and openly let my viewers know about it. This has totaled to about $4,400. That is a pretty cool thing for a company to do because unfortunately right now we live in a world where civil liberties is a controversial issue and I do get the occasional comment crying about it. At this point, most major music retailers have reached out about a partnership and some music retailers offer a higher percentage of sales, some offer less. Outside of that, affiliate marketing is a major industry and I, like anybody who has a YouTube channel with some subscribers, has a massive amount of options and generally the less i like a product or company the more money i can make from that sale for example nike will give me one percent of a sale nordvpn will give me 40 percent of a sale if you so much as create a barclays online banking account they'll straight up pay me between 100 and 250 dollars for the lead investment and loan companies pay out as much as 500 dollars. generally if you go through an affiliate management company and sort by who is paying the best it'll be what you see a lot of podcasters and youtubers have have been recently promoting. Years ago, I did some affiliate partnerships with CuriosityStream and Audible, as I was using both of those products before I was asked to be an affiliate. I think that in a lot of cases, though, if you're a one-person operation like I am, sometimes managing affiliate partnerships and payments is more work than it's worth. So managing an affiliate partnership should be as easy as putting a link in the description and then going to the affiliate manager once in a while and moving money from there to your PayPal or bank account. But this only works if you trust both the affiliate management program and the company to act in good faith. My first affiliate partnership was with CuriosityStream, and if you click the link that I provided you and signed up for CuriosityStream and actually paid them, I would get around $20. I don't remember the exact number, but it was actually quite high considering how much the membership costs. And over the course of a year, I made about $1,000. And then all of a sudden, the monthly money just dried up to a trickle, and I figured that people just weren't clicking the links anymore for some reason. But after a few months of this, I realized that Curiosity Stream had gone from paying me 20 something dollars per sale to just a few dollars per sale without notifying me and I realized that they were completely within their right to do so. The problem is, is that I recorded the material for the affiliate program and put it in my permanent video when I thought I was getting 20 something dollars. And now after three years or so, these videos went from having 15,000 views to over 100,000 views, generating a lot more clicks. And I got the raw end of the deal. I'm likely not going to be doing any affiliate partnership again, unless I know and trust the company and have a good sense of loyalty back and forth with them. I've uploaded two videos in the last month, which is a little bit less than normal because I've been traveling, but in that time I've made $652 for about 235,000 views on this channel. I don't think any YouTube creator has a reliable normal. I especially don't because I don't put out videos on a rigid schedule and my topics are all over the place, but on average my monthly payment from YouTube is about $1,100. That, by the way, is very low for a channel this size, and the reason for that is because I don't like overlay ads or anything 
anything that distracts from the flow of the video. This includes mid-roll ads. Those are, well, if you're not a premium subscriber, ad blocking these. I'm not gonna bore you with an expense report, but right now I'm staring at about $10,000 with the camera, the lens, the recorder, the monitor, the confidence monitor, the tripod, the microphone, and then a whole bunch of lighting over here. In the other room, there is a camera that never moves and a bunch of lights that are mounted to the ceiling to light up a green screen. And God forbid I make a video where I leave this house because then you have to change up the mics, you have to change up the lighting, you have to have battery powered everything, you have to have a camera stabilizer and so on. Long story short, the amount of money that YouTube pays me through ad revenue is not coming anywhere close to the costs of operating this channel. Another way that I've concocted to try and monetize this channel without sacrificing integrity is scheduling. If I simply do not have time to check out a piece of gear that I otherwise really like and I think that you would like, or if there's a product launch for that piece of gear and a company wants my video to come out in a specific window of time to line up with their marketing, I will ask them for money. And they are essentially buying the time slot of a different video for this channel. There is no set figure for this as it's contingent on a lot of things. So for example, when Novation sent me this thing, I liked it, I still like it. I think it's a really good value. I still use it upstairs and when traveling. They had the option of me making a video when I had time to make one or paying for a video when they were marketing and releasing it. They chose the latter and that money went directly into the fund that rented a high-speed camera and purchased some science tools to make How the World Sounds to Animals a few weeks later. And that's basically how this channel sustains itself. The videos with the most impact take a lot of time and money, especially the ones that require me to run the script by lawyers. So it is definitely a juggle. And since Patreon and gear content pays for science or content like what you're watching now, it's about as ethical as I can personally make things while keeping the lights on. By far the number one source of income for this channel that has not only allowed me to make better content, but has given the channel a sense of financial stability ability is, and you knew this was coming, Patreon. I started my Patreon a little bit over two years ago, and I now have 1,300 patrons and make about $3,800 per month. And the vast majority of my patrons don't demand exclusive content. They just understand that the less I have to weigh all of the other variables in this video to make content, then the more original, pure, and honest my content will be. Now, don't get me wrong, there are a lot of perks in my Patreon membership for a lot of my patrons, and a lot of people have probably come out with a net positive over the years if they utilize the gift giveaways and exclusive coupon codes. In addition to this, for as long as my Patreon exists, I will be dedicating a half day once per week for a weekly stream. And it's worth mentioning that Patreon does charge a pretty high percent for what they do. I'm effectively giving them $400 a month. But what the overall concept has made me realize is that you and I, the creators or writers and musicians or humans, are the valuable assets in the ecosystem, not the intellectual property we create and put a made up price tag on. So when I record a video of my ducks slurping up duck food, which is objectively hilarious, and then a bunch of people repost it as their own without consent or attribution, and then a bunch of agencies come out of the woodwork trying to scam me out of the publishing and monetization and copyright claims, I just don't give a fuck. I don't have to participate in that toxic circus because I have a healthy community of supporters who want me to keep creating. And honestly, if you enjoy the content that I create, it would really help if you join that community. And it's not even just about money. Even if you only had $1, you could still be part of the Discord community and participate in the monthly songwriting challenges. That's what I'm a shill for. Anyway, I know this was a long one. If you're still hanging out, thanks for watching. I hope you learned something. I hope this cleared up any opaqueness with my channel at least. And I suppose now it's time to see if I want to make that motor synth video. Bye.